Let's take a trip back to the 1990s, a decade that only lasted 10 years. Star Trek The Next Generation had found its stride on TV and drew millions of viewers each week. This was also the era of the licensed video game, with seemingly every movie and show getting one. By this point, Star Trek had already had a long history with video games, but only with the original series. The Next Generation wouldn't get their first mass-produced game until the end of the series. How would the next gen translate into a video game? We'll get into that and see how everything turned out. This is a look at the first Star Trek The Next Generation video game. Star Trek The Next Generation was released for the Game Boy and NES in September 1993. The Sega Game Gear version would follow over a year later in October 1994, after the series had already concluded and one month prior to Generations being released. The Game Gear would also get a Generations game two months later in December 1994. I have a separate video on that game nearly complete, so tap that subscribe button if you want to catch it when that one goes live. Each of these are the exact same game, with the only difference being some slight visual upgrades and overall graphics. We'll get into that in a few. Just real quickly, I want to address this. The first actual Next Generation game was released in 1989. Star Trek The Next Generation, The Transinium Challenge. It was a super small release for DOS and Tandy, whatever that was. These Nintendo and Sega games were the first to be released to the mass market, so I'm counting these as the first true Next Gen games. They were developed by Absolute Entertainment, a game developer best known for nothing. It looks like they've moved on to the emerging private event DJing market, so it's good to see that they've diversified. But no, seriously, they don't exist anymore. They would later morph into a new company named Skyworks Technologies, which released their final game in 2011, Boardwalk Ball Toss, which seems like the sort of game you would release before going out of business. Anyways, let's get back to the game. This is its box art. They just slapped together two publicity stills. So that should give you an idea about the amount of effort they put into this game. The Game Boy game is what you'd expect. The graphics are good enough so you can figure out what's going on. Faces and locations are recognizable. The sound is horrible but non-essential so you can turn it down. Then we have the NES version. This is easily the best looking version of the game. It's amazing how they squeezed photorealistic graphics out of the NES hardware. Especially, no, this game looks like vomit. I mean, we all remember the Enterprise D's purple viewscreen wall. Finally, we have the Game Gear. Sega does what Nintendo don't, so color. But not just that, this game is a full 16-bit upgrade, or whatever bit level the Game Gear was. In any case, the visuals are better across the board. There are transition scenes that the Game Boy version simply didn't have. You get a glimpse of Starfleet Academy, which looks like they digitized an actual image from the show. When you warp to new locations, there's a pretty good animation that would be impressive even on a home console. There is also a nice shot of Dry Dock as well. The main difference between each version of the game is its name. On the Game Boy and NES, it's simply Star Trek The Next Generation. On the Game Gear, it's titled Star Trek The Next Generation The Advanced Holodeck Tutorial, which considering the premise of the game, sounds more like a legal disclaimer. Let's get into that. The game's premise is simple. You're Captain Jean-Luc Picard on the bridge of the Enterprise. Plot twist, you're actually a cadet in a holodeck training simulation proctored by Picard. That's an interesting twist. The structure of the game is you receive an order from Jean-Luc Picard, which is always a combination of go to a place, fight a thing, beam someone up, or beam someone down. All of these happen in distinct sections of the game. The first is controlling the Enterprise. Then there's the engineering mini game that you play when the ship takes damage and you need to redirect power to a system. Finally, there's the transporter portion, where you beam things up and you beam things down. The default view is the view screen. Here you have some comm badges on the bottom. Each one represents a crew member. There's Worf, Data, Geordi, O'Brien, and Riker. Each of these corresponds with the ship system. Worf readies the weapons and shields. Data navigates. O'Brien beams things up and down. Geordi handles repairs. And Riker's there for moral support. In a nutshell, this game is a series of procedural tasks that need to be performed in an exact order to progress each mission. Once Picard gives you a mission, select data, scroll through a list of planets, and choose your destination. Though it's not in alphabetical order, but you're a Starfleet cadet and you gotta be ready for anything. Once you arrive, you're greeted with an enemy attack. This is where the meh begins. Select Worf, tell him to raise the shields. You're taken back to the view screen, so you'll need to select Worf again and have him arm the weapons. You can't just select Worf once and perform both actions. Got that, cadet? Now comes the select button's time to shine. The D-pad controls the Enterprise speed and steering. 
Makes sense, right? Only problem is you can't do both at the same time. You need to toggle between steering and acceleration using the select button. Just locating your attacker is a task unto itself. You can check with data to use the sensors to find your attacker. Only by the time you check and return to the view screen, they've already moved, so there's no point. This means flying in circles for as long as it takes to randomly find them. All the while, your attacker will be taking pot shots at you. When hit, your weapons, shields, impulse, whatever, can all take damage and may need repairing. Here's where Jordy comes in. Select him. He tells you something like the photons are down. You're taken to this mini game where you guide a spark from one end to the other. The spark starts up here, travels through these lines, and ends up down here. You toggle these things to guide the spark between the lines. At the end, you have three spots, each with a different letter. In this case, P, S, and T. Since you're trying to repair the photons, you'll need to guide the spark to the letter T, since the photon system starts with T. I got three sparks there though and nothing happened. It worked when I routed the spark to the P though, so must be a bug. Back to the space battle. Phasers only shoot in a straight line and only in the direction that you're headed, just like the TV show. And photons are about as effective as spinning out the window of a moving car. Eventually you'll chip away at the enemy until they're dead. But don't worry, this is just a training program that doesn't proceed until you've killed people. So if you want that chair, you're gonna have to get your hands dirty. I don't know if I can do this. Then you'll need to carry out the rest of your mission. The next steps are usually go to a planet, pick someone up, and transport them elsewhere. This means press select, scroll over to data, do a scan of the planet, return to the view screen, press select, steer towards the planet, press select, set impulse speed, press select to make steering adjustments, press select so you can slow down and not shoot past the planet. Select data, tell him to initiate orbit which to most people would mean entering a circular flight path around an object. But you're a Starfleet cadet, you gotta be ready for anything, unless you plan on flunking out. You'll need to fly zigzags through these boxes in order to successfully get into orbit. From here, make sure your shields are down and your transporters are operational. If so, select O'Brien, who will beam up whatever needs to be beamed up. This initiates another mini game where you move a cursor across a grid searching for your targets. You do this by moving the cursor while watching this bar. It rises as you get closer to your target. If the mission has multiple people or objects to beam up, you'll have to do this in a specific order. Sometimes the people are also running around, so there's that to contend with. Once you get your cursor over the target, beam them up. Some missions have you transporting them elsewhere, so repeat the previous steps just in reverse order. Picard pops in when you complete a mission. You'll then get another mission to do the exact same things, just maybe in a different order. This is the entire game. It was designed by Mark Beardsley and Gregory A. Facone, if you care to know. Someone must want you to know because their names are on the back of the box. I wonder how that decision was made. Up to this point, Beardsley's video game credit history started only one year prior on a few other licensed Game Boy games. The Ren and Stimpy Show, Space Cadet Adventures, and The Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Neither of these games were groundbreaking, and I'm pretty sure one of them has a grammatical error in its name. The same goes for Gregory Facone. His gaming credits begin in 1992 as well. And unless Bartman vs. Radioactive Man makes a comeback and finally gets recognized as a forgotten gem, I don't see anything that warrants getting his name on the back of the box. Okay, so if you're old enough to remember GamePro Magazine, you'll know that they were one of the most popular video game review magazines around. And if you're old enough to remember GamePro, you're also old enough to have a 1 in 5 chance of having high cholesterol. So you should go get that checked out. Anyway, the Game Pro review says, The Game Gear controls do a workman's-like job of enabling you to cycle through the six crewmen and access the systems at their stations. They completely snub the select button here by not even mentioning it, but we know who the real hero is. The review goes on to say, The game's challenge may make the staunchest fans consider dumping their warp course. Interpret that as you wish. This is the kind of game that needs an ellipsis in the title. It never ends. It just keeps repeating missions over and over. Remember how the Kobayashi Maru simulator was a no-win scenario? This is just that. It's actually a no-win situation, because the game just keeps repeating missions over and over and over. There's no completion. It's an 8-bit Kafka nightmare. 
Select data, leave orbit, select data, set course, don't forget to set your speed, warp to wherever, arrive at wherever, get attacked by someone, press select, select warp, raise shield, select warp again, arm weapons, engage impulse, press select, select data, press select, select sensors, enemy explodes, press select to send impulse, impulse steer around, and to raise your speed, and exterminate the other side, and then spray and press select again, grab your legal, your speed, your destination. Absolute Entertainment, we're back the following year with Star Trek Beyond the Nexus. Subscribe and do that bell thing to get notified when that and future videos drop. TNG's first foray into games wasn't as bad as it could have been. It wasn't a generic 2D side-scroller like many other licensed games at the time. The game was thoughtfully designed and captured the look and spirit of the show pretty well. It just wasn't fun to play and frustrating to control. The next gen would soon get some decent games. Depending on how this video does, I may do a video on those. We'll see. I'd like to thank these unappreciated select buttons for all their support of the channel. You guys rock. I'll catch you in the next video.